warm welcome to you all. Our guest tonight is Teja Suni Padu. She is a doctor. And tonight, during this episode of One on One, Teja Sweeney is going to share with us her journey in the medical field, but also highlight the importance of caring, not only our physical health, but also for our mental health. Teja Sweeney, thank you so much for joining us in the studio of the NBC. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Teja Sweeney, you are a doctor. You studied medicine. So what, what motivated you to do that, uh, to follow that choice of career? So... Since I was very young, I had quite a keen interest in the science subjects, in physics, in chemistry, in biology, in mathematics. And I knew that one day I would like a career that involved these subjects. But also as I grew up, I learned more about myself and my person. And I discovered that I would be the happiest in a career where I would be working with people where I would be at the service of people because I do enjoy the human connection a lot and I believe that making an impact in the community is very important. So medicine just seemed to be the perfect marriage between the sciences and giving back to the community by working for people so that is how I decided then to pursue medicine. Is medicine a part that you always wanted to follow then? So the decision to pursue medicine came around when I was 16 years old. Um, that is also the time where I had to choose what subjects um, I was going to study. And it's also a time where you become emotionally more mature and you learn more about yourself and your personality and what you enjoy, what you like and what you dislike. So the decision came round about that time. So it was more of a thoughtful, mature decision, as mature as one can be at 16. <laughs> And that is when I really started seriously considering medicine. Before that, I was quite indecisive. And it's normal to be indecisive, to find your path and to find out who you are. And, but after I completed my high school, I spent some time doing some volunteer work, also job shadowing, um, following doctors around in the clinics, and that is when um, my passion for the, for the field really solidified, and I was certain this is what I'm going to do, and this is what I really enjoy, and then I became a doctor. <laughs> and how do you see your journey so far? You even went to South Africa to pursue your studies. Yes, so my journey has been full of ups and downs. It has been quite the ride. It wasn't easy to leave the country, to leave my parents, to leave everything I have always known behind and then to go to South Africa, a completely new country. I had no family there, I had no friends there, I knew no one. And I knew I was embarking on quite an academically demanding degree. So. It has been quite difficult. I guess the journey was not smooth at all. Um, after high school, there came a very big decision, which was where, where must I study medicine? Yeah. Because I knew I wanted to study medicine, but now where? And with my parents, it was quite a family decision. We knew that I, we, I, was, I wanted to go to a university that had a solid reputation, a solid background and where my degree would have quite um, weight and value in the international field, in the international space. So there were a few countries, universities in a few countries that I had applied to, so the UK, France, South Africa. And it wasn't an easy decision because studying medicine, the process is quite complex to apply to do the entrance test, to satisfy all the minimum requirements, not just academically, but also in terms of your extracurriculars, because you need to have quite um, a solid background because it's highly competitive. In good universities, the seats are very difficult and it's, you have to outshine everyone on every aspect. So it was quite difficult. I had to do a lot of entrance tests, I had to do a lot of job shadowing. I had to show my interest in the field. So 
Finally, there was also the financial aspect. Of course, to study medicine in the United Kingdom, is, it's not cheap by all means. So we had to consider a lot of factors, a good university, which my parents could afford, and also which had a good reputation for the medicine degree. So then I got accepted at the University of the Witzvorteschrand, which we call Witz University in Johannesburg, South Africa. And taking all factors into consideration, I decided to accept the offer and go study there. So I was ranked after the laureates, I was 23rd in the HSC. So um, unfortunately, I, I didn't get a scholarship to go study medicine. My um, parents had to bear the responsibility of funding me. So there were quite a few challenges. And I think the biggest way to overcome these challenges is to have open communication with your parents and to get a lot of guidance and support from your family, from your relatives. If this, if this is the career you want to pursue, it is not easy and you need as much knowledge and information as you can get. The second biggest challenge as well was, as I said, leaving my country and going to a new country, living alone for the first time at 19. But I loved every moment. Johannesburg is such a vibrant, colorful, cosmopolitan city. It really opens your mind to live there. You mature and you meet so many different people coming different from... Different cultures as well. Completely different because South Africa is highly multicultural. You have the Afrikaans people, you have all the Zulu people, the Hossa people, and they're all coming from different walks of life, different provinces all around South Africa because WIT is a top university, so it accepts students from the whole country. And you just get to mix and, com and, and converse with these people. It just opens your mind to different ways of thinking. At the beginning, it was quite a culture shock. It was difficult to adapt, but I made quite a few friends and I think it's those friends which have become lifelong friends that helped me get um, over the culture shock and really integrate into the society. And also I kept in touch with my parents. I was calling my mom every day. <laughs> with technology, it's very easy. Yes. And that also helped me going. So there was a period of adjustment, a few months where it was quite difficult and it's normal. But once you get over that stage, it's you start enjoying your time and enjoying yourself and getting to discover new cultures. But then once that was gone, the academic demands of the medicine degree were arguably the biggest challenge I faced in the whole of my six years in South Africa. Um, for all the young people who want to pursue medicine, they must understand how difficult and demanding. It requires a lot of discipline. Uh, yes, a lot of self-discipline, a lot of sacrifice, because other students your age, I saw in the university, they had a lighter timetable, they had more time to lead a balanced life, but the medicine students, it is, it is a marathon. And during my last two years, my fifth and sixth year, because it is a six year degree in South Africa, it's your clinical years. So what happens is you go to the hospital and you do rotation. So in every field of medicine, in medicine, in, in pediatrics, surgery, obstetrics, gynecology, and you rotate over two years over the various specialities. But what, what is required of you is you have to go to the hospital and you have to be there at seven o'clock in the morning up until four o'clock, five o'clock in the afternoon. And you, they allocate you to a unit. So a unit is a team of doctors um, looking after a certain number of beds. So you get allocated to the unit and you become an integral part of that team as a student because South Africa is an under-resourced country in terms of healthcare. So they need all the help they can get. So what really sets the South African medical training apart 
from other countries, from other universities in the world, is how hands-on and practical the training is. As a student, you do so much. You perform procedures, you clock patients, you assist in theater. When your unit is on call, so on the weekends, night shifts, you're also expected to be there on the weekends, doing night shifts, participating, learning, and you also have to attend tutorials there are lecture theatres in the teaching hospitals that I went to. So you have to go and attend bedside tutorials. Because South African medicine is, they focus, because they're under-resourced, they cannot afford to train doctors that only rely on in expensive tests, expensive investigations. Mm -hmm. They train doctors that can rely on themselves. So your clinical skills, so your ability to take a history and your ability to examine a patient is very important. So I spent a lot of time in the hospitals and then you have to come home and study. Study hours and hours and hours on end because the exams are very difficult. So the pressure and the stress of this degree is incomparable. So if you want to pursue this career, you have to be mentally um, train yourself and physically to withstand that pressure. Teacher Suni, our discussion tonight will focus more on mental health and there is a correlation between our emotions, character and well-being. Why do you think that it is important to spread awareness on mental health? So I believe that there are two major reasons we should spread mental health awareness. The first reason is it is very common to suffer from mental illnesses and what we need to understand is that mental illnesses don't discriminate. It affects people of all ages, of all social backgrounds, of all races. Anyone can be affected and mental health is everybody's priority. Just as much as we look after, we try to look after our physical health, we should also try to look after our mental health because Leading on to my second reason is that mental health issues and illnesses can have such negative repercussions on a human being. They can hinder your functionality to such an extent that you're unable to perform your activities of daily living. You're unable to function as a person in society. It affects your social functioning, it affects your interpersonal relationships very negatively. And unfortunately, the situation in Mauritius, we can see that our population is suffering from mental illnesses. And they're unaware. And they're unaware. A lot of people are going undiagnosed, and because they're undiagnosed, they're untreated. So. We see so many young people going into drugs. The school performance is declining. Our population is not healthy mentally. And we really need to raise awareness on mental health because we can have a physically fit population, but a mentally unfit population is not productive either. And it can be very damaging to our society. Unfortunately, as you said, people are not aware. They're, we're not aggressive enough in our campaigning, in our education. We, it's still very taboo to speak about mental exactly. health. Do you think there's still some stigmatization around that subject? Definitely. There's a lot of stigmatization. So during my time in South Africa, when I was in university, it, amongst the student population, we were organizing a lot, of, a lot of events. There was a lot of talk and focus on mental health, well, more amongst the medical students and doctors, but there was a lot of conversation happening. And there were a lot of events where people could come and they could voice their stories, their opinions, their advice, what they've been through. They were, these events were marketed like a safe space where you can come and you can talk about your struggles or how you overcame your struggles. And there was quite a shift in the mindset and we could see a lot of focus 
on, on mental health. One of our course coordinators even started to implement something called Mental Health Monday, where one Monday per month, no lecture is to be scheduled on that Monday, and you not allowed to study, you have to go do something, you have to go hiking, you have to go get a coffee, you have to go do some exercise, some sport, and you have to take a picture and tag that coordinator wow. on Instagram mm -hmm. so that she could see. And it's, it's compulsory, <laughs> you had to do it. So it was quite interesting to see that there was this, this, this focus on, yeah. on mental health. So there's still a lot of stigma there, but there's more talk happening, there's more awareness, um, mental health day was quite a big thing. Unfortunately, the Mauritian situation is is looking quite it's it's looking quite bleak. There's there's not enough talk. We're not we're not talking about it. We're, there's there's no engagement with the topic. People are not aware of men of what is mental health. How do I take care of my mental health? And for the stigma sorry, is very real the stigma the taboo that it's it's deep rooted it's ingrained in our culture in our society i grew up here i know and people refuse to talk about it because if i come forward and say well i'm i'm suffering um i think i need to go see a psychologist well more often than not People will tell you, but you're crazy. When you're crazy, people go to psychologists. You'll end up in, in Barnes Car, which is, it's not right. Yeah. It's not okay. People should be encouraged to voice out their struggles. People should be encouraged to speak. People should be encouraged to seek help. But unfortunately, there's not enough being done in, in Mauritius. Yeah. It's very really sad because the brain is just like any other part of our body, right? Yeah. So it's important to care for that as well. Definitely. Yeah. Teacher Swani, what are the risk factors that you consider may cause mental distress? Okay. So the risk factors for mental illnesses is they, they are multifactorial. So we can look at them in categories. So you have your biological risk factors, your psychological risk factors, and your social risk factors. So with the biological risk factors, there is a genetic predisposition to the matter. There's also um, Adverse events that occurred intrauterine, so when your mother was pregnant with you, if she fell sick, if she took certain drugs, certain medication, or if there was quite a lot of trauma during the birth process, it does predispose you to mental illnesses further down the line. Also, um, certain medical conditions can cause mental illnesses, so hypothyroidism is associated with depression. Also, neurodegenerative disorders such as Alzheimer's. Um, and also in the physical risk factors, you can also put in substance use. So drugs, cannabis, recreational drugs, alcohol is also a major risk factor. Psychological risk factor usually is quite your, if you've undergone quite stressful life events, such as usually in my studies, what we learned is that the most stressful life events is problems with the law or recent major losses such as a death in the family, someone very close to you, or a divorce, and also traumatic life experiences. So people who served in the army, people who were in great danger, to the, who, had, who nearly lost their lives. Also, it's quite traumatic and it can predispose you. Your social risk factors include abuse, your childhood abuse in um, be it physical, emotional, even unfortunately sometimes sexual. And what we've come to learn is that your early childhood years, up until the, which encompasses the years up until the age eight, is critical, critical to what you will become in the future. So taking care of, our well -be of the well-being of our young children is fundamental. And UNICEF is doing quite a lot of work raising awareness on the early childhood years. And social risk factors, you can also, if people are bull experiencing bullying at school, bullying at the workplace, experiencing discrimination, that also can all predispose you. But also I think when you talk about risk factors, it's also important that we talk about protective factors. And protective factors are everything that are, that are 
um, contrary to the yes. risk factors. So if you have good social support, if you have good emotional support, if you perform well academically, um, if you lead a healthy, active lifestyle, if you have um, easy access to healthcare, mental healthcare, that all forms part of protective factors. So decrease your risk for mental illnesses. So I think it's very important that as a country we work on eliminating these risk factors aggressively because sadly um, mental illnesses, they can kill. And according to the World Health Organization, suicide is the fourth leading cause of death amongst the 15 to 29 year olds worldwide. And that is alarming. It is an epidemic. It is a pandemic. And we need to remedy to the, the situation. Teacher Suni, if we are talking about mental health, it's also important to talk about the aspect of loneliness. Uh, we live in such a hyper-connected world mm -hmm. where everything is connected through social media, internet, but yet people feel lonely because they refuse to have some face-to-face -face interaction but rather prefer a virtual one. In that sense, do you believe that uh, it, may help, it may cause someone to affect their mental health and give away their sense of self-worth and belonging? Of course. I mean, loneliness is a known risk factor. Poor social support is a risk factor. But it's very interesting because, you see, we talk about being hyper-connected via technology. But when you look at it, you're actually disconnected. Exactly. Yeah. Because uh, bec interactions via technology, via social media, they are, you'll agree, they're not the same as human connection. There's, no, there's not the emotion no, aspect. No. Our, we are all so engrossed in our phones, in our, on, our, on our iPads, on our laptops, that we forget to connect with human beings. And connecting with human beings is a great way to take care of your mental health. True connection, where you actually listen to people and where you feel listened, you feel valued by people. Definitely. So what other changes do you believe uh, someone should bring in their lifestyle to better take care of their mental health and well-being? So there are a multitude of things you can do and I'll talk about a few of them. So the first thing and what's very important is practicing mindfulness. And practicing mindfulness is about being in the moment. So when you're talking to someone you focus on that person, on your conversation. When you're eating, you're not in front of the TV, you're not in front of your phone, you're focusing on eating. You're focusing on yourself and you focus on what you're doing in the moment. And technology is not necessarily an, a bad thing because nowadays there are a lot of apps that you can download, there's Calm, there's Headspace, that you can download and practice mindfulness. The other thing is also, as I said, human connection, talking to people, talking to whenever you have a problem, an issue, or even when you're fine, talk to people, engage with people, with people you love, with people who are close to you, but also people you don't know. Also, um, it is very impo important to practice healthy coping mechanisms. When you have an issue, when you have a problem, whatever the problem, you cannot have coping mechanisms that are problematic, exactly. such as yeah. alcohol, To drugs. be healthy. Yes, it's to have maybe when you're stressed, you practice the sports that you like, swimming, football, running, practicing a hobby that you enjoy. Um, I myself do some embroidery and it helps me calm myself and really practice mindfulness because I'm in the moment. Also, it's very important to lead an active lifestyle. Healthy eating and physical exercise. They're primordial, they're critical. We are actually drawing towards the end of this episode, but before that, Tiju Suni, what are your objectives now as a doctor? Um, so my objectives now as a doctor is to f complete my medical internship. And then it is to hopefully one day, there are a few specialities that interest me a lot, so psychiatry is quite an interest, but also I, I really do enjoy the surgical field, 
so perhaps um, continuing my journey and specializing in surgery but also it is to become a doctor which, who's at the service of the Mauritian community yeah and what's your advice to youngsters who wish to make their dreams come true like you've done my advice is to believe in yourself firstly and always seek guidance and seek support from those who've who've walked the journey before you and to always know that there is help available and there are people who are willing to help you so of course hard work is non-negotiable but also give yourself the tools to succeed so seek help and believe in yourself Thank you so much, TJ Sweeney. It was such a delight to have you on the set tonight and talk about such a wonderful topic like mental health. Thank you so much. Dear viewers, we have now come to the end of this episode. Thank you for your time. We hope to catch you next week at the same time, same channel. Have a great evening.